Welcome to our Bible study. It's good to have you back with us this week. Uh, we're going to talk about sa uh, salvation and about ways that we can reach out and uh, bring the gospel to other people and how we can um, enrich ourselves with the gospel to make us better Christians. Uh, we, this this comes at a time that follows Easter. And Easter, you know, of course, is the, the good news season when Jesus was resurrected from the dead and and he appeared to his disciples and others, and he told them the secret and the truth about uh, him being their savior. Uh, you know, they didn't really get that before he died, and they didn't really get that before he was resurrected. But now things started kind of falling together, and they began then to have a new message and a new song in their heart that Jesus Christ, yes, he did leave them, but he gave them the Holy Spirit. And because of that, it allowed people to have a new understanding of God and the Spirit and what Jesus really did for us and how he saved our lives. Uh, now, I have a sheet of paper here, and I'm not going to go through every one of these, but you can kind of see that. Uh, but I'm going to just give you, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to begin today by talking about sharing your faith. And they have uh, scriptures and different things in which to do on here. I'm not going to go into great detail on any of that because this this isn't uh, in, in each of our lessons, uh, in, uh, in our lessons for this week. But it does give us a good way in which to start. And so when I ask you, if you want to be somebody who is sincere and courageous about talking to others about Jesus Christ, first of all, you have to develop a burden for the lost. That's the first thing. Uh, Romans 9, 1 through 5, in that Paul affirms uh, that he has a heartfelt, uh, a heartfelt, uh, what would I say, uh, dictate to reach out to the lost and to tell them about Jesus Christ. The second thing is to let your own life be a witness for those around you. So the first thing is, is to have a burden for the lost. You know, we see people every day going through problems and difficulties. You turn on the news and everybody has problems. Everybody, you know, tornadoes and hurricanes and, and uh, you know, just different things that go on. People uh, suffer great losses and have big, have burdens, etc. cetera. Uh, and you wonder how they get through it, how they make it, death and, and sickness. Uh, and, and so we have a burden for those individuals and we can tell them about Jesus Christ and about the Holy Spirit. So develop a burden for the lost and then let your own life be a witness to others. And then seek to know those who need Christ. You know, look look for people who, who you know are not Christians. You talk to them and you know that they're not. Uh, be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Know the problem that separates humanity from God. Recognize that people all need hope and they can get hope through Jesus Christ. Share your story with the love of God. Share your story. Now, I'm just going to give you an example here. Uh, there was, a, when I lived in, when I had a church in Owensboro, I went to the gym every day. And there was, and I, I would meet different individuals. And, and, you know, we would talk in between sets and reps and stuff. And we would uh, talk about different things. We never really talked about Jesus or, or, or much, but, you know, I could interject about church and, and I was a pastor. If I was a pastor, you know, I kind of got their ears. Some people kind of avoided me and others it drew them to me. Now, uh, I could have beat them over the head with the gospel. I could have told them that they need to be saved or ask them if they're saved. If they're not, they're going to go to hell, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not the way I operate. Uh, I just uh, became a friend to them. And I remember with this uh, th this one fellow named Zeke, a ball-headed guy. Uh, he was not a Christian. And he, he went to, to the hospital. Uh, I forget what exactly. I think it was his heart or something. And so I went up and visited him, which totally blew his mind. He thought, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I just want to come up and see you because we're friends from the gym and everything. And I just want to come up and have prayer with you and see if there's anything I can do. And we and we talked and what have you, but I didn't force anything on him. I just kind of let it go because I was trying to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And what does he want me to do? Now, some some people, they feel the Holy Spirit pushes them to make uh, you know, knock on your door and you come to it and ask them if they're saved. I mean, people are going to think that you're crazy, probably, uh, and they're going to avoid you. So first of all, you got to get to be their friends. I mean, this is the way I, that I think it is. It's it's called lifestyle evangelism. And so and so I went up and I, and I talked to him and, 
for a while, and then I had prayer with him, and um, and and th then I left, uh, and then he came back to the gym about a week later, and he said that there was another minister that came up to talk to him. I'm not sure how he got his name, but he said he pressured him and everything else to become a Christian then and there, and that if he died, he would go to hell, and he needs to make that choice, and and. Um, and, and, and Zeke told me, he said, you know, I didn't appreciate that. I didn't like to hear that. I didn't want him forcing me on that. I would never make a decision in that situation. Uh, and so I said, well, um, you know, I, that's, you know, some people are like that. And, and in some cases, that's a better way, but that's just not the way I do it. And so we, we worked out some more and, and, and what have you. And, um, and then I went up to the hospital about, uh, well, and he worked out some more and came and we talked and what have you. And we, we got to be pretty good friends. And, and then about um, two or three months later, I went up to the hospital and I saw a guy that was sitting on a bench up there. And he looked just like Zeke, except younger. And I said, are you Zeke Thompson's son? And he said, yeah, how'd you know? I said, you look just like him. And he said, um, and I said, he's back up here again. He said, well, he was, but he died. And, um, you know, he, you know, he just died while he was up here and, um, he said, and, and this guy didn't even know me. And I said, well, I was good friends with him. I'm Tim Bell. And he goes, Tim Bell. Yeah. You're the minister. You're the pastor, uh, uh, that, that worked out with him. I said, yeah. And he goes, well, he told me to tell you that he became a Christian, that he accepted Christ into his life as Lord and Savior, that he, he he knew what you were saying. He wanted you to baptize him, but he, he just didn't last that long. And, and um, well, that made me feel even worse, probably. I mean, I was joyful and all, but, you know, you know, to, to, you know, to know that what little that I did for him, that it actually paid off for him and he didn't, wasn't going to spend eternity in hell. I was just grateful, but, you know, I really missed him because he was a good man. And then when I found out that just based on what I told him, that he became a Christian, of course, it was based on the Holy Spirit working in his life, but based on what I told him in my simple life and and struggling around and, you know, being basically a loser. And yet that was good enough for the Holy Spirit to use to be able to bring him to the kingdom of God. And and uh, and, and I'll never forget that. Um, I, I'm not going to, I'm just using this as an example. I'm sure you probably, most of you have led more people to Christ than I have. But I remember when I was in the Navy, and there was a guy that was in there with his Bill Peel. And, um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't pushy with him or anything else. And I'd invite him to go to church with me. And he did go. And I remember we'd go out in the parking lot and he would light up. And I'd kind of get tickled because, you know, not anybody hardly was smoking out there. But, you know, to him, it didn't make any difference. Um, and we were good friends. And, and you know, we, we did uh, a few things together. Not a lot, but a few things. But we worked together. And so we got pretty close. And, um. And then after I got out of the Navy, I went to the seminary and um, and his uh, wife called and she said uh, they had moved to Indianapolis. So I lived in Evansville. So it was like, well, I don't know, a couple hundred miles away. She said, Bill, Bill became a Christian Sunday because he came forward and he was baptized and he said he owes it all to you. And so I said to myself, what did I do? Um, you know, let me tell you, I'm the most uh, fearful evangelist that you would want to meet. You know, I don't push, I don't push it on anybody. I just tell them the story and I let them know who I am. I tell them what God did for me and, and these other evangelists that come along and they say, are you a Christian? Well, would you follow the Lord? Would you do this and that? Put me to shame. But that's just not how I am. Uh, but there were people who, who became Christians because of my weakness. And I think that's what the Holy Spirit, that's how we can really praise him. Because in spite of the fact that we do the best we can, which is, which is pitiful, the Holy Spirit takes that and makes it a powerful testimony to other people. And so my advice to be a good evangelist is to get to know somebody and to befriend them and to let them know that you care about them and that you're there for them 
that you have some things in common with them. And then you ask them, you share with the fact that you go to church and everything and then invite them to church. And then, then, you know, one thing can lead to another. And I usually let the Holy Spirit just, just, you know, guide me, you know, and help me along the way. Now I, I was a camp pastor for 16 years. Uh, that was just something I did one week out of the year. It wasn't a, I, it wasn't a paid position or anything, but it was for uh, th th three and four and five and six and uh, see three through I think three through seventh grades fourth through seventh, and we would have uh, a minister come up and he would be the camp pastor and he would give a sermon every day and the missionaries would be there etc. and um, and so uh, I remember that there was this uh, little girl. And we were playing games and stuff, and I was talking to her, and she asked me a couple questions. She was probably ten, maybe, and um, and I asked her. I said, uh, "If you want to become a Christian, you can. All you have to do is ask Jesus to come into your life, and the Holy Spirit will change your life." And I said, "I'll tell you all about it." And I said, "You want me to?" And she said, "Yes." And I told her, and then um, I said, "Do you want to become a Christian?" And she started crying, saying, "Yes." Uh, and so sometimes things come easier than at other times. You know, I don't know how the Holy Spirit's going to lead you. I don't know what doors are going to be open for you. Um, I have, you know, worked with people before and, and you know, things worked out and sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't. You know, that's up to the Holy Spirit. He just has to lead me into doing and to saying and to acting the way I am. My personality, I'm basically an introvert. I'm not somebody who's, who's, uh, you know, jumps on people and, and, you know, tells them the way things need to be. And, and when I preached, you know, I was not a, a hellfire and brimstone kind of a guy, you know, I was more of a, um, well, I tried to preach God's love. And by the way, that's what Kevin does. He's not a hellfire and brimstone preacher. He doesn't get off on, on tangents, on, uh, you know, necessarily certain sins and this and that and how terrible things are. He preaches on sin, but he he doesn't focus on that. He focuses on the salvation of God. And that's what I always did. And probably that's why it took longer for people to become Christians when I uh, spoke to them. But they stayed Christians. You know, a lot of people who you force and, and give them, you know, twist their arm to become a Christian, they don't really know what they're doing or they're doing to get you off their back and they become a Christian and then, and then that's all there is to it. Um, I uh, went on vacation once and this evangelist came in and he filled the pulpit and there were like 12 people that got saved, you know, 12 people that was unheard of. And one of them was the Catholic piano player who was a young girl. And uh, one of them was a baseball player at Kentucky Wesleyan. And there were, there were a bunch of them. And so I went around to follow up on them and none of them, none of them really made a commitment. They really didn't want to get involved. The ones, the mother made her quit playing the piano at church because this minister, you know, he had a uh, sermon of hellfire and brimstone that scared everybody. So they came forward, but the pressure was, you know, they came because of the pressure of fear, not the pressure of love. Uh, so anyway, that's, you just have to kind of, uh, you know, just, you know, don't say I'm not a great evangelist. Well, it's okay to say that because that's what I would say. I'm not, uh, but everybody has their own style and God wants you to use your style, but he wants you to focus in on the help that the Holy Spirit gives to you so that you can make those situations work. Now, if you just start off by developing a burden for the lost, which was the first point here, um, and let your own life be a witness for Christ to others, that in itself is going to go a long way. That in itself is going to open a lot of doors for you. And then seek to know those who need Christ. You know, uh, get involved with people who are lost. You can't just hang around with church people all the time. You've got to get involved with people where you work or people at the gym uh, or, you know, you know, wherever. You know, go go to, um, I'm not saying go to a bar and get drunk or anything, but if that's where you know lost people are and you need to go there to talk to them, then go there. And Jesus did. Do, do whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Uh, be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. You know, some people he'll, he'll they'll go faster, and um, and their their message will be the same, but it'll be delivered in a different way. Uh, know the uh, problem that separates humanity from God. You'll know about sin. Know about the gospel, and you don't have to uh, use a lot of scriptures whenever you tell somebody about Jesus Christ because they don't believe in the Bible anyway. What you need to do is tell them your story. 
tell them how you were and how Christ influenced your life and how he changed your life and how he made things better for you and gave you not only the promises of a happy and abundant life on this earth, but also gave you the promises of eternal life. Okay, well, so anyway, that's that's kind of the breakdown on that first part there. So let, let's look at some of the scriptures uh, for today. And, um, and if you look in Romans um, 10, 8 through 10, Romans 10, 8 through 10. This is what Paul said. The message is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness and one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. I mentioned about this last week. Basically, when somebody stands up and says, Jesus is Lord, and they say, I profess him as Lord and Savior in my life, that's from the mouth. And that is what he's talking about. It's that profession. But then we take the next step. Not only do we profess the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord, but people see it in our lives. Our lives change and the, and the Lord that we confessed and that we professed and said was a part of our life has changed our life and people can see the change that we have in our life. You know, she says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and then believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So it's a total change. It's not just, um, you know, a, you know, you know, you know, something that comes from something that you read and you say, oh, yeah, I want Jesus to be in my life. So I profess Christ as Lord and Savior. That's 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 important. And, and, and you need to take a stand before men and say that. But then your life needs to change. And if your life does not change, then you need to look and see what kind of profession you made. Was it really a true profession of faith or was it not based on really Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and a change of your life? Um, oh, I, I told you some stories. I, there, there, there's another one. Uh, and I was uh, one of our church members owned an auto parts store and I was in there. And this guy came, his name was Novi, he came in there. And um, I, I told him I was a minister and all. I mean, it just laid into that. I don't, I don't, you know, when I see somebody, I'll say, well, hi, I'm a minister. But I said, you know, Larry, who was the owner of the store, I said, he goes to our church. I'm the minister at, at Panther Creek Baptist Church. And, um, and, and so about, oh, six months later, six months, I didn't even talk to that guy anymore. Larry told me that this guy had cancer. He said, no, he has cancer, but he wants you to baptize him. And it was only on that, those few words that I said to him that day. And just, uh, I guess, you know, he said he could see in me. Well, I'm not going to go into that because I, that's, that's not important, but, but, uh, but the way that I approached him and the way that I approached life seemed to be what he wanted. And so I said, OK, uh, I'll go talk to him. So I went and talked to him and he was uh, he had he had colon cancer and he was in pretty bad shape already. But he wanted to be baptized. And I said, well, you don't need to be baptized. No, I mean, it'd be hard for you to get to church and get in the pool and everything. And I said, you, we can take care of that. You don't have to do that. I can baptize you in the bathtub or not at all. Baptism doesn't save you anyway. And I said, it does show uh, a, a, you know, newness of life. But I mean, I can have some people come over and we can have it right here. But he wanted to go to the church. He wanted to get baptized in the church. And he came and, and he had a hard time getting in and very difficult getting out and changed his clothes and all. And he got home and, and uh, you know, he told me that uh, he slept like a baby that night. And he said that his life, you know, was changed. And I said, well, you know, this is wonderful that your life changed. And he says, yeah, but I feel so good now. I wish I would have done this 40, 50 years ago. And I said, yeah, that's always the way it is, but that's okay. You, you're you saved now. And, and so eternal life is going to be yours as far as being with the Lord in heaven because you professed him before me and you were baptized and you were, uh, that's, that's your profession of faith. And it showed that you were risen in Christ and, and and so you know he was a, he was a happy camper. So you know there was a situation where, you know I led this guy to Christ by just talking to him for a half an hour over nothing, and 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 yet and yet he could see in me something. The Holy Spirit worked with him through me in some way 
miraculous way that he became a Christian. Now, I don't, uh, you know, I don't take any credit for that because I tell you, like I say, I'm, I'm not much of a, of a pushy. I'm not very pushy. I don't, you know, but you know, you'll do this. I've, I have told a lot of people about Jesus Christ and I have expressed my testimony about what Christ meant to me. And I have tried to lead a good life. In, in fact, in front of people specifically who I'm witnessing to. And so that was just kind of the way I kind of, you know, go through the back door. But I'm not saying that I shirk my duties and didn't do what I was called to do. I just do it a little bit differently. Uh, and um, because I'm non-confrontational and, and, and so when people, you know, walked with the Lord and, and, and you know, followed, you know, followed the, what the Holy Spirit calls, called them to do based on some message that I, you know, was able to, to, to get out in some way, it just proves that if I can be an evangelist, you can, because there's nobody that's weaker than I am. So you can do it too. Uh, and and God will uh, use you and the Holy Spirit will use you and minister to you and for you and will change lives. I guarantee it. It may not be as fast, but the ones that become, that do get saved, they'll stay saved because of the way that you did it. Uh, some people, some uh, evangelists, you know, they, they tell you to take your shoes off and, and uh, you know, and, and uh, touch the floor and that's, you feel how hot that is or that's hell below you and you're going to, you're not going to make it. You need to do and just do all these scare tactics. They get a bunch of people to come forward, but there's not really much follow through or anything else uh, because they they didn't make a sincere commitment because they didn't really know what they were doing out of fear. Well, anyway, it says the scripture says that everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. Since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. See, Paul, he said, look, you've come for the Jews and, and God came for the Jews and Jesus came for the Jews because they were the ones that, that were God's chosen people that should have known about God and about his love. But they looked at God as being a God who would be vindictive and he'd be a, a conquering God that would come along and just uh, annihilate the Romans. And when they saw that Jesus was kind of a mealy mouth guy, I mean, he was... He was, wasn't afraid to take a stand and to speak out, but he wasn't going to raise an army and go against Rome. That's what they wanted. Uh, they they uh, left him, a lot of them did, because they weren't the kind of Messiah that they wanted him to be. And so the Jews put him to death, you know, because they did not, he, he did not fulfill uh, their idea of what the Old Testament scriptures said about who God should be. Now, I don't blame the Jews for that. I put Jesus on the cross as much as anybody. Had I been there, I would have been just as bad probably. But the point is that if any of us have sinned, we put Jesus on the cross. Uh, the Jews just had a little closer part in that, the Jews of that day, uh, not the ones today, but the ones of that day. So anyway, uh, so there's no distinction between Jew and Greek because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you call upon the name of the Lord, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman or, or who you are. You know, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Now, you may know some pretty rough characters in your life. People who you don't think will ever, would ever become a Christian. Uh, and yet, people surprise you. Uh, if you've ever read the story of... Uh, George Wallace, you remember he was very, he was a segregationist, a segregationist and, um, you know, he, he would not allow uh, the university to be interracial, and they had to send the National Guard to let him go in, and he said, I think it was a statement, I don't know exactly what it was, but it was something like segregation today and segregation tomorrow and segregation forever. I mean, he was, he was really... Uh, you know, I, uh, he made KKK look like kittens. Uh, and he was very hateful. And he was a guy who, who, who would never, you know, never change. I mean, he's, he just, he's just like that. I mean, how, how could somebody who hated uh, black people and, and just, just think that their man by his actions show that they were useless, how could he ever change? And so, um, you know, you know, there he was. And so you just kind of thought, well, there's no hope. This guy, he's in bad shape because he doesn't even care about the dignity and lives of all people. 
Um, and then uh, somebody tried to assassinate him. You remember he ended up in a wheelchair and he had a conversion experience. Uh, I'm not, I don't know if it was necessarily that he accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, but he had a conversion experience on how he looked at black people. He totally changed. He went to a church. He was still the governor and he went to the church that, that uh, I think he was governor at the time. I, I just, I can't, I, I don't know. Don't, but, but anyway, he ended up staying in politics after all this happened. But he went to this black church and at, uh, and at the end he went forward and asked them to forgive him and asked him to pray for him and to tell him that he was sorry. Now that, that's unheard of. Now, you may not believe that. I don't know if you know who George Wallace was, but you need to look that up on the internet. Look at some YouTubes and see what he did. It is phenomenal what he did. And the people believed him. The black folk believed him. He was so sincere and so genuine that they believed him and they installed him. He, he ran for a, an office and they and he got elected for it. Uh, and it was from the black vote. And he said, and I know that's what it was from. You know, there you had a totally changed man. Here it says, um, how can they believe? Uh, it, uh, well, anyway, I'm not going to go back to those scriptures. I recovered those, but uh, that was the end of the last ones that we looked at. But anyway, um, God can save anyone and he can change anybody's heart. Now, to me, that that uh, a change of heart like that, I mean, I, I mean, I just can't imagine that. Uh, it, well, any, anyway, uh, verse 14, how then can they call on him? This is what Paul's saying. They have not believed in. So he's saying, how can people call on the name of the Lord? They don't even know who the Lord is. And how can they believe without hearing about him? How can they know who Jesus is? They got to hear about him. And then he says, and how can they hear without a preacher? So Paul's saying, how can anybody change their life to follow Jesus if they never even heard of him? And, and how are they going to hear from him unless a preacher goes and tells them about Jesus Christ? And how can they preach unless they are sent? And he's saying, and how can the preachers, how can these people, how can the prophets, how can the ministers, how can they go forward and preach if they're not sent? If God doesn't send them, if you don't send them, if you don't pray for them. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So Paul is saying, but there are preachers that are going. There are missionaries who are going out. And it's because of the Holy Spirit. It's because that God looks at all of these things in the hearts of these people. And he sees that they're lost and they have, they have no way to know about Jesus. And so, as Paul says, how will they know unless somebody's sent? And then he says, and, but they are sent. God does send them. And they go out and they teach the word. And it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all obey the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the message about Jesus Christ. So you have here the end that Paul is talking about. He said, not all have obeyed the gospel. People have said, uh, God has said, go, go into the world. Uh, preachers preach about Christ. Missionaries preach about Christ. Um, laymen preach about Christ. Tell others about the good news. But nobody goes. No one goes. Isaiah said, I'll go send me. But he was the only one in that chapter of Isaiah as he was looking. Uh, King Uzziah had just died and, and Isaiah was uh, you know, in the courts. And that's when the angel came and told and told him and told Isaiah to go. And, um, you know, you know, God, God said he, he, God was speaking to him as well. He said, who, who can I go? We have so much to do, so much to carry on. I don't have anybody to carry it out. And Isaiah said, I'll go send me. And so he became one of the greatest prophets, you know, that we know about. And so God calls you to go out. And he doesn't say, go out, knock on your neighbor's door and twist their arm and call them heathens. If they don't go to church, he says, just go next door and find out about your neighbors. Talk about them. Find out about their families. Find out about what their interests are. Uh, then when you get to know them pretty well and you get to be pretty good friends, invite them to church. Uh, or if the door's open, tell them about the Lord. And and you just let the Holy Spirit be your guide. You know, I can't tell you what to do and how to do it. But here again, what it says here, as I talked talk about at the beginning, 
develop a burden for the lost. If you do that much, you're halfway there. Then let your life be a witness. Lead a good life. And then seek to know those who need Christ. So have a burden for the lost. And then live a life that's conducive to a Christian. And then find out who are not Christians and start working with them. Start being a friend to them. Be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Know the problem that separates humanity from God, which, which you would know that if you're a Christian, and recognize that people need hope. And, and I, I wouldn't even, I would skip those last. I would skip those. I would say, develop a burden for the lost. Let your own life be a witness for Christ. Seek to know those who need Christ. Be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and share your story with the love of God. These other ones are all part of it. Know the problem that separates humanity from God. We know that when we tell them our story. And we know that people need hope. You know, we, we recognize that from the beginning. So anyway, that's neither here nor there. But what I'm saying is, is that to be an evangelist is a calling that all of us have. Every Christian should be an evangelist. And you have your own style. And, and the Holy Spirit will lead you in that if you open your heart and open your mind. And are sensitive to where he calls you and what he wants you to do. And so that's this uh, ch uh, chapter that we've looked at on, on evangelism. And we're getting uh, close to the end of the quarter. Uh, I, I noticed uh, that our, our next uh, lesson is live the message. So it's going to be you know, living out the message of hope and the gospel that Christ has given to us. <laughs> so let's go ahead then and close in prayer. Father, we thank you that you loved us and that you gave us your son, Jesus Christ, and that through his love and through his death and through his redemption of us and through his resurrection and just through his His walk of life and through his grace and through his mercy and through his forgiving of us of all of our sins that you have opened up the, 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 the gates for us. But uh, even, even as important as that, you have given us a life in which to live of hope. And I know a lot of times, Lord, we're looking around to see things that we can do. We may have some time on our hands. Well, one thing we can do is to make friends and to be a part of other people's lives. It may mean uh, subbing at school or it may be going to the gym or it may be getting a job as a greeter in, in a store. Um, it, it could be anything. You know, there are a lot of ways in which you can reach out, volunteer in the hospitals and what have you, to where we can reach out and we can uh, uh, allow people to know that the Holy Spirit abides in us because they see hope in our lives and they see love in our lives and they want to be part of that. So I pray, Father, that you will guide us and that you will give us insights into how best to follow you and how to be a messenger to the world around us. Thank you, Father, for our lesson today. In Jesus' name, amen.